Yeah, then maybe before we start with the uh, questions on research and on politics, maybe you could give us a quick overview about the Dersim question and you could tell us about Dersim in 1937 and 1938. Let me start by defining what Dersim is. Uh, Dersim, I, I would call it, first of all, one shouldn't think that it's an administrative, well-defined administrative unit. No, it was not. Actually, what we call Dersim today, or what Dersim is some called Kurmanjia, that's the land of Kurmanj, is not a, is not a, is not a, it doesn't have a, it, it's not a geography which has been with, with well-defined uh, borders, or it's not part of just one administrative unit. Actually, it's more like a political geography. Political geography, which has its roots uh, going back to um, 16th century, if not earlier. We are talking about, uh, first of all, this is a very, uh, pretty much mountainous area uh, and uh, difficult to reach. And like, um, and for a very long time, it's been the home for a heritage, you know, a, 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 the Kızılbaş uh, Kurds, um, Kızılbaş Kurds who speak two different languages, two different Kurdish languages, Zazaki and Kurmanji, mostly Kızazaki. Uh, but it's also an area uh, which had considerable, especially parts of it, which had considerable uh, Armenian settlement, Armenian population. But what defined this area was the predominance of this Kurdish language speaking Kızılbaş. And the discrimination against Kızılbaş goes back to, 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 to the 16th, even before century, um, and to the rivalry between Iranian and Ottoman empires. But uh, as a question, there's some question, there's some being, uh, being seen as a question, starts more in, 19, in the 19th century, mid-19th century. Uh, until that, it was an area, like many other areas, similar, comparable areas, like Iskenderun, or Gyalunda, as it's called, uh, Mountain of Infidels, or Mox, Bahçesaray today, where you had these, uh, let's say, non-mainstream groups, who are trying to not let others govern them. I wouldn't call them as an autonomy, but I would rather call it the art of not being governed. That is what they performed for a long time. And that was fine until mid-19th century, where you see the beginning of centralization efforts on the side of the Ottoman Empire. And at the same time, you see emergence of new modernizing actors, like missionaries, which further um, uh, which, which actually kind of jump-started uh, the center's anxieties about these so-called heretic groups or, you know, or uh, infidels, mm -hmm. if you will. And the problem with Kızılbaş belief or the Ezidi belief or, or, or Lusailis is that they are, not, they are not within the framework of the, uh, the, 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 the faiths with with, with, with biblical tradition. So they kind of like, you know, double marginalized, you know. Um, so uh, they did not have legally defined status within the Ottoman Empire's uh, confessional system. Exactly, in this belief system of the yes. Ottoman Empire. And, but the, 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 the that's the question, as we know it, is after like you know, mid 19th century, and two things is that one thing is like, you know, the emergence of new actors arrival of new actors, and also a new effort by the Ottoman state, centralize it. Centralize meaning doesn't only mean that you send the governor there, but you also want to fix the way the cultural life, political life, social life, economic life, you know, you want like, you, you go for conscription, you do want like, you know, to increase schooling, blah, 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 blah. So that was So the these are question. like colonial efforts. Exactly, colonial okay, efforts. Okay. and a good example of internal colonization, but again, another like you know, uh, but the arrival of missionaries was a, was, a, was, a, was a very important development in redefining, you know, in turning their same presence into a question, especially with Iran, the Armenian issue, especially in 1890s, with the uh, early uh, massacres, uh, widespread massacres. So uh, their same issue gained a new momentous or new 
predominance and also it was redefined before until then it was pretty much an issue of insurgency banditry lawlessness right but then it began to be seen more as a political issue mm -hmm. right? and uh, how was this then um, sort of taken over also by the republican politics and then exactly. leading up to the 30s the important break there i think one i think break or one um, uh, one uh, important turning point is the is the is the is the, is the, is the constitutional period, period 1908 with uh, young Turks coming to power uh, and 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 with them uh, with that, then the kurdish question was redefined and a new policy new approach against kurds was introduced the idea that Kurds, like many other troublemaking groups, were more open to assimilation. So if you do certain things, you can um, uh, gain them or you can incorporate them to, to the national body. Yeah. Right? And, and with the Kemalists, the issue was understood. And that continued until the 1990s, actually, was as, as an issue of feudalism. So you have the modernizing uh, state on the one hand, and on the other hand, there's a reaction to that. That reaction was a reactionary one, in the sense that it was the feudal um, exploiters of the people, uh, this Aga Sheikh, that is tribal or religious leaders, who were not only exploiting their siblings and keeping them backward, uneducated, ignorant, but also weaponizing them, using them against the against the state apparatus or states in general. Um, but let me open a parenthesis here that, like you know, I mentioned the groups like you know these new modernizing actors uh, like uh, uh, missionaries, Ottoman state. One should add to that Armenian revolutionaries and Armenian intellectuals too. If you like, you know, bring all these two groups together. One thing in common was that like, they all defined their sin as a savage beauty. But they also thought that there was something wrong about, the, about their siblings, people of their sin, because they were not what they are supposed to be. They were, they were not what they were archaically be. They, 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 they archaically were. Uh, and they, they needed to be, they, they needed to be healed, treated. To 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 go back to their origins, mm -hmm. to reclaim their true identity, for and get rid of the so-called savage uh, belonging. Yes, and for instance, like you know, for for missionaries, they were the ancient hidden Christians, who who yeah. who, 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 who who had to conceal their faith because of Muslim oppression. And for Armenian intellectuals, their destinies were uh, Armenians who had to had to had to hide their identity because of the Turkish yoke, Turkish oppression. And for Kemalists, actually, their destinies were mountain Turks, and the mountain Turk was used first and especially, specifically for destinies, not other Kurds. In 19, starting with like the late 1920s and 1930s, to to denote that like you know they were in, indeed Turks, true Turks, real Turks, but they were assimilated into Kurdishness through Kızılbaş fate because of indifference of the Ottoman state to the 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 Turkic populations of Anatolia. And can you tell us now quickly how um, this sort of reached its peak um, of, of, uh, in 37 and 38, yeah. what events happened? So, for a long time, we have Dersim Aziz, and then after mid 19th century, you have a Dersim question. And with the Kemalists, they thought they, thought they need to find a solution to this problem. And they did so without any provocation. Actually, on the contrary. You know, because as of 19, like, you know, even like in late 1920s, Dersim, notables, notables of Dersim, both tribal and religious leaders, they were all aware of political leaders. They were all aware that something was brewing against Dersim. An interesting anecdote is, for instance, like, you know, uh, I, don't, I mean, Kemalists introduced this 
head cloth, head cloth. I mean that you need you 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 you're not allowed. You were not. You will be allowed to wear uh, uh, traditional turbans or other headwear, but instead Western style hats. And you know what? You don't see it elsewhere. But if you look at the pictures from Dresden in early 1930s, you see so many people, so many leaders who were called as rebels. Uh, wearing that, those like you know hats. One reason because they are trying to appease the state apparatus. They are trying to bargain, but this time, unlike previous incidents, the state apparatus was not bargaining. And this thing came with, with you know, unlike the Armenian genocide, which the the victim group Armenians were caught totally unprepared. Here, they could see step by step, approaching a plan. There was an anthropology behind it, like you know, you see, like you know, books published about the characters of Dersin, different types, what, who, like you know, Dersin lay like a you know, woman, uh, over sexual, and 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 like you know, and a man beast like very strong. I mean that like you know these themes that you come across in many other colonial genocides. So there was a demonizing uh, process of a whole community first happening. Until then, 37, 38 took yes, place. Yes, yes. And, and in this process, also like those old tribes were categorized. They were divided into categories as animal ones, to be annihilated, to be exterminated or cleansed, and the neutral ones and friendly ones mm -hmm. to be uh, gained or even used in operations against them. So, in short, uh, this is not only genocide. This is a dictionary definition, full, full fledged genocide, in the sense that it's got like, you know, uh, intent, preparation, anthropology, uh, and pretty much, I'm not saying that it's the same thing, but pretty much the processes that you see in Holocaust. For example, like the Armenian genocide is different in that sense. So this is not like, you know, for example, like, you know, comparing with the Armenian genocide, I think this is, is quite different in that sense. And if you look at the numbers, so uh, Dersim was like, you know, the population of Dersim area was around 100,000 according to the official census. Some go, some number estimates go as low as 50,000. And again, if you look at, if you take official figures, 13,000 were killed. Mm -hmm. In a, in a military operation in 38. 37 and 38. And actually we, we say 37 and 38 because there are two stages. And the real deadly one was 1938. The, uh, the spring and summer of 1938 was the real uh, destructive one, where you see large sections of uh, certain tribes totally exterminated, like Demana, Haidara, I mean, uh, yes, uh, uh, really, quote unquote, of effective, uh, unfortunately, uh, extermination of their cities, and 11,000 were sent to exile. Mm -hmm. So, and as I said before, out of this 100,000, if, if you think that like, the population was 100,000, the target, the target of the population was probably 30, 40,000. So it means that, like, you know, almost half that, even with like, an official figures, were exerted. How is this historic event nowadays, jumping back to nowadays, uh, remembered by um, the community and also on a state level and also of the general public? Let's start with the state level, which is very straightforward until at least now until mid 2000, which is that, like, you know, yes, there was this uh, uh, the Republic was, you know, Republic, uh, uh, the, the ideology of Republic was the or the objective of the republic was to modernize the country to take it to to, to the contemporary uh, level of civilization and basically that thing was described as a tumor as a as a as a as a as a as a as a, as a problem to be healed or not even healed you know which needs to be removed by surgery so to speak uh, so uh, and as I said before, so it was this issue of feudalism who basically were resisting this civilizing mission of the Republic. And as Sutri Kaya said in one of like his assembly speeches, actually there was nothing, um, there was no emergency 
security emergency in the area. There was no major insurgency or turbulence, but that the Republic, the Republican elite or the Republican regime would not tolerate the, the, the situation in Dersin as is, right? Um, and, and part of this rhetoric was that, like, you know, so they were not just just reactionaries, but they were also rebelling reactionaries. They rebelled against the Republic, and that's why the, the, the Republic uh, or the Kemalists had to punish them. So it was kind of like deemed not only as a healing process, but also a punishment because they rebelled. And the, the second group you said, like, you know, how, like, you know, locals or the Kurds perceive it. Uh, before going to Dersim, let me start briefly say a couple of words about how Kurdish Kurds or Kurdish movement began to remember it. And we are talking, I mean, I, I think we need to go back to like you know, early, um, to, 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 to late 60s, early 70s, the making emergence of the Kurdish movement. Emergence of the Kurdish movement, that is the process of Kurmanj becoming Kurdish. Kurdish was a term that outsiders used to describe Kurds, actually. Kurds never called them could call themselves as Kurdish until recently. So Kurdish nation building was the process of Kurmanj. Kurmanj meaning different things. Kurmanj meaning, you know, a term mm -hmm. which had different meanings in different locations, different for different sections of the population. A, a Kurdish was like, you know, becoming was like, you know, an umbrella term to bring all of them together. Many you know, different marginalized groups within exactly, Turkey. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Creating that, uh, like, you know, a common history. So, and within that framework, uh, the idea of rebellion came very handy to, to those uh, early uh, pioneering Armenian Kurdish nations in the sense that, yes, there was this attempt, extermination, assimilationist effort by the Kemalists who wanted to get rid of the Kurds at any cost and uh, with all means possible, so it was a legitimate act, a heroic act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. So this was the other narrative, the Kurdish narrative. Um, uh, and then there's a the local narrative. I think what differentiates local narrative from those two others is the emphasis on uniqueness. The idea that Dersim is unique. Dersim is unique in the, in the sense that, that because of its fate. Dersim is unique because of its religion. Dersim is unique because of its openness to civilization. Dersim is unique in terms of its openness to education. You can go on, uh, go on, go on for uh, increased uh, examples. So, and, and, and especially after 1990s, you see Dersimli elite, intellectual elite, Dersimli, uh, let's say, artists trying to, trying to, trying to, trying to explain this uniqueness. Uh, and 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 the emphasis again is not like you know this is not another example of oppression of Kurds. This is a different ex a, a, a example. So it's yeah. a bit of a counter narrative to uh, the Kurdish perception or the Kurdish memory. Of exactly, the and in which you see less emphasis on the notion of rebellion, because obviously uh, there was you know. Uh, we will come to that in a minute, perhaps. But there was not only that there was no see, uh, no, 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 no strong effort of resistance, uh, but also that uh, the one of the strategy of the the, 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 the operations against Dersim was to incorporate as broad sections of Dersim population as possible against the the enemy uh, elements of their sins. So uh, it kind of like, you know, uh, turns you into parts of the population into cooperation with perpetrators. So, so remembering it from their sin has many complications. You know, the closer you get to the population, the, the, the more you have to encounter the complexities of uh, mass violence, like anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. And how did you think the apology done by uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who was then Prime Minister of Turkey in uh, 2010, changed the uh, process of remembering uh, or the practices of remembering? Let's start, like, you know, let me say a couple of words about like, the, 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 the positive mm -hmm. 
outcomes of that. One positive thing that came out of that apology is that it became easier to talk about the death of genocide. Right? Then you'll be start like having conferences one after another, you know, and uh, and there was even an effort to uh, uh, to erect a memorial. But when you say uh, there's some genocide, uh, was it called a there's some genocide? Uh, he never called it there's some genocide, but uh, more like in the massacre uh, and uh, and the killings uh, and injustice. You know, again, like in a way, you know, trying to to I mean not not conceptualize it as it um, uh, is due to be uh, uh, conceptualized, but. Uh, more like like you know injustice uh, and 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 brutality kind of thing, um, uh, but that is the good part. And then even today, it's relatively it might be relatively easier to talk about that same issue uh, with uh, maybe to with limits. Not it's not like Turkey is not the same Turkey as it was in uh, early two thousand ten or before 2010. So um, that was the, the, the silver lining of, let's say, uh, this uh, apology thing. But I have like, you know, really concerns about this notion of like, you know, apology, especially if apology doesn't come with an effort to empower the victim group. If it's apology, is just an apology, it's got double meaning, right? Because first of all, you put the thing which was hidden before on the table, you normalize it. People see it, right? And you normalize when nothing else comes after that. Like you think about it, you put, you you define, you say that yes, there is injustice here, right? There is bloodshed here. There is massacre here. But after that, if you don't do anything, it kind of has the effect of banalizing it, normalizing it. And second thing, apologia is a very related. It is a quite related term. It's also like it works as an explanation as well. You kind of like, you know, normalize it, explain it. And I think that's what happened in that some case. Um, uh, and and then and also like you know, one should also be aware of like you know, political use and manipulation of apology. Because you know, if you think about like you know, why Erdogan did that, uh, because they needed to like you know to they had an issue, they thought they had an issue with the Kemal's period. So they needed, like, you know, they, they liked that idea that, look, Kemalists did big injustice to, to certain groups. And actually, that, that group, that victimhood, can also be transferred or reflected upon other groups, or it can be associated with the, 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 the presumed victimhood of Sunni uh, religious uh, majority of Turkish majority of Turkey. It is again this shared sorrow of different groups, as exactly. you mentioned before, and uh, in this case it happened all under the one umbrella of democracy and the republic. Exactly, exactly. And uh, another issue there is that the leader of the, 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 the opposition party is, is from Dersin. And Kılıçdaroğlu. So, so in a way, and of course like we are talking about, we are not talking about the same party, it's the continuation of that party. But it might sound weird, uh, odd to to, 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 to to people who listen to this. But yes, like you know, it's like the 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 perpetrator party is still you know a party that perpetrated a genocide is still a legal power political party, and the leader of it today is from Dersin. So in a way, Erdogan. Manipulated the the sufferings or the tragedy, and used it against another Dersimli. So, you know, might seem like quite clever, but also I think it also raises questions again about, I mean, how we should, I mean, how like we should be very careful about when we approach jump to like an, a, an apology as a solution uh, or as a step forward. And there's a third thing that, like, there's this famous poet, Nizhi Fazıl Kısakrep, and he has this famous, famous, famous um, poem about um, Dersim, like a couple of uh, lines about Dersim in his book, 
son devrin din mağdurları uh, victims uh, victims of fate of the uh, of the republican period mm-hmm. you know as if they were like you know, again like in making it like you know, kind of ambiguous as if that fate is sunni fate i mean that that's that's you know Yeah, yeah. And and this um, solidarity is in the end not a genuine one, but just one for its own purposes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah whenever we talk about remembering apology, we should we, are, we, we should definitely look at its politics. Yeah. Another example. And in your uh, in your own research, for example, um, you question and you challenge the research on the Dersin question and um, propose to use oral histories and um, local elements to counter these, you know, to sort of, um, again, challenge the official narratives that are happening. Um, can you tell us something about these types sure, of sources? Sure. I think this might be useful, especially for the German audience to think about, like, you know, Holocaust in a different, you know, perspective. Because you don't have widespread denial of Holocaust today, right? What if you have a systematic and official denial of a genocide? And you are talking about that genocide that really changed the terms of everything, terms of remembering, terms of expressing, terms of demanding, right? That is what happens in Turkey today with Armenian and Dersin genocides. Because they are officially and systematically being denied, despite the so-called apology about the Dersin case. So my question was more about, in my work, like, you know, I mean, and this is, This is a big problem if you are writing about those issues, in the sense that you have the burden of proof. You know, denial leaves you with the burden of proof. You have to prove that those people died were really, were, did indeed die. Those people killed were, did indeed, were, were indeed killed. Or those people t- were sent to exile, were sent to exile for that specific reason of exterminate or putting an end to a social network. So, and, and, and this comes with lots of troubles because you, you end up, I'm not talking about deniers, I'm talking about those, the scholarship, I'm, the, I'm talking about the, 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 the placement or I'll say, um, uh, I'm talking about uh, res- uh, respectable, let's say, scholarship, right? I'm not talking about this uh, state-sponsored mm-hmm. uh, uh, denial uh, scholarship, but even that is has that has to carry that burden. Because you try to prove. How do you prove it? How do you prove something to state? Because that is the one to be proved, right? Or those who believe in those, those narratives, and then you need to use credible documents. Witnesses and survivors. But not any witness. It needs to be a credible witness. So if there simply is one side of it, then you don't trust that simply, right? Because it's like you think about the court. I mean, so so then you need to go to, to state documents, right? And then you need to prove that they did not really deserve it. How do you do that? You say they did not really rebel. I mentioned the rebellion uh, um, argument, right? Like, you know, the you know, Turkish official rhetoric Uh, remember the Wake Amendment, and then the Kurdish moment, again, they share this issue about rebellion. But actually, if you look at the person, there was no rebellion as such. There were attempts for resistance, but you wouldn't call that a, like, you know, uh, a rebellion. The resistance is not a rebellion. That's another thing. And let's assume that there's a rebellion. What does it, I mean, we, 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 okay, we will touch upon it. But the issue is that then, on the one hand side, you use as much official documentation as possible because they are reliable, they are, you know, state documents to prove something. Second thing, you recreate the state mentality. That is to say that like, you know, state normalcy in the sense that try to prove that they didn't really rebel. What if they rebel? If they did rebel, so does, does that just why a genocide? And uh, I will come back to this issue in a minute. Um, actually, my work, my uh, academic work, focuses basically um, 
primarily on the Armenian genocide. But I did work on the single party period, that is uh, 1920s to 1938. I did work on resettlement policies, work on Dersim. Uh, but my dissertation was on the German Armenian genocide, and you get a similar picture there too. So, my issue is, my question is, how do we go beyond the implications of denialism when we do research on these genocides? Right? And what kind of distortions? Denialism do create on researchers themselves, right? And 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 that is why I want to like you know focus more on how these victims see everything. And um, because you also uh, drew comparison to uh, the Shoah and how the Shoah is remembered in Germany, for example. Um, I would at this point also add that also in Germany, but also other European, uh, many, like most of the European countries, you st do still have the practice, commemoration practice um, of uh, survivors' testimonies, even, if, even in Germany, and uh, you still have, which, is, which has been a very valuable uh, practice actually and much appreciated. So it's, uh, the oral history is, um, I think also acknowledged here as a very uh, legitimate practice of memory. Yes, and and you want I mean many probably like you know listeners won't that will not believe that until uh, 1990s Armenian scholars try to try to eschew from try to keep away from using Armenian sources because they thought that like you know that would decrease the power of their narrative. Power of proof, right? And the way I use, I mean, in this, like, you know, I wrote a couple, like, you know, one recent article on Veliye uh, Rusheni Imami, who was a sayir. Sayir means poet. So Devsim did not have a written tradition. I mean, they, they basically had this, um, uh, uh, Devsim had this oral tradition of narrating things uh, or keeping. Uh, the, 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 or the or the way they remember it, the way they circulate their knowledge, and, uh, it's, you know, until 1940s, 50s, but pretty much, and it continued until actually today. But there's a whole um, um, tradition in which sayer or poet, uh, poets had, uh, had a very central key position. Right? They tell the story. They tell the story from, of course, their own. I'm not saying that they tell a story that everyone in their community certifies or accepts. But the thing is, like, you know, over generation, if it survives over generation, it shows its how widely it's acclaimed by the community. And it also, like, you see also these changes in the oral narrative because you don't, like, you know, it's transferred from one generation to another gener generation. Like uh, that carbon copy, um, but the way that I treat Veliye uh, Rusheni Imami's poets about the massacre, about the Ersin 1937 38, I didn't treat that as oral history. I treat that as an analysis, like a scholarly analysis. And my argument that was that 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 he does a much better job than all of us. Mm. And I mean, of course, uh, especially in the 20th century, um, there was an acknowledgement of artistic and literary uh, work to have the um, capability to establish a counter narrative or counter discourse to the public discourse and narrative. Thank you very much. Um, you also sort of often in your work, you raise the importance of um, the ethics in research when dealing with past violence and crimes. Uh, what are your concerns about this topic of ethics and within the world of academics and research? One striking thing about, let me go back to Beliye Mushani Imami. Uh, uh, one striking thing is like, you know, his most, most of like, you know, his levels, they're full of regret for not rebelling. For not resisting. What I mean, and what do we do when we try to prove that they didn't resist? 
Can you see the tragedy here? The most popular Dersim lemons, I mean, these are not like you know, lemons just um, recited by a few. These, I mean, the, the, the lemons that I use are among the most popular Dersim songs. They all, they're all about regret about not being able to resist. And what if you are trying to convince the Turkish audience, the state, that they did not indeed rebel and they were actually paying taxes, they were orderly, uh, law-abiding people. Actually, many of them were not. And second thing, once you are trying to prove something, what you do is you create these perfect categories of victim and perpetrator. But many victims were actually collaborating with the uh, perpetrator. Right? And you see, for instance, in, the, in, 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 in that uh, famous, um, uh, very, very popular lament, reference to Armenian genocide. And we talk about, like, you know, and it's 1937 and the Armenian genocide was only two decades ago. They remember it very well. And it was also like, you know, it all around, happened all around them, even in Dersim, right? So they know it. And the poet actually likens one group of Dersimlis saying, saying that like, you know, your fate will be like that of Dersim, uh, Armenians. But for him, that meant that like, you know, because you don't resist. So he doesn't like to take that as a good thing. Actually, he's critical of that. And, uh, and basically, he says like, and there are also those resist. They will be, their place will be in heaven with uh, Hussein in Karbala. With reference to those religious mythology, Kızılbaş mythology, that like, you know, that, yes, we die here, we die for a good reason, because the enemy came and that, but also this complexity of the story. It's not one layer. You don't have victim one on the one hand, and it's just like, you know, this is all happening to us because of those tribes collaborating with the state. Those who turn their back to us, those who even don't say, may God save you from these troubles. Mm -hmm. So you see this, I mean, really very sophisticated. And at the same time, it never relegates everything to a, a like, you know, very simplistic Turkish versus Kurdish or Alevi versus Sunni thing or Kızılbaş versus Sunni thing. It's always a very sophisticated and complex story as all cases of collective violence are, mm -hmm. right? It, it gives you a really high resolution picture or, or image of what was happening there. So I don't treat Veliya Vesheni Yimami as a material, research material. I actually, I'm saying that it is a very good analysis of what happened actually much better than what we have produced under the conditions of denials. So, and then how can, then I raise the question, of how can we go beyond this? Well, how can we stop talking to, to deniers and try to convince them? Because first of all, we should, we should put away the idea that denialism is not about lack of information, lack of knowledge, it's a political position. It's not that they don't know what happened, or it's not that like if they know better what happened, they're going to change what they their position. I know that from the Armenian case. In early 2000s, when I was doing research in Armenian archives in Yerevan, and they asked me like you know, you know, about if one day Turkey would recognize the genocide, and at that time I'm talking about like in 2005. I said, I, you know. Yeah, in the eastern provinces, we all know about what happened to Armenians. But in West, like, for example, in Manisa or in Izmir, people say, like, what the hell are you talking about? But, okay, Greeks, okay, but, you know, what about Armenians? And I said, like, you know, perhaps months, like, you know, people, Turkish uh, public, get to know, better understand what happened, what kind of, like, you know, evils their ancestors did, did ancestors did to others, probably that would raise awareness and change their position. Actually, the history of what happened since then proved me wrong. It's the other way around. 
we began to talk about the Armenian genocide. And many, instead of saying, wow, what a shameful thing, other than like, you know, like in a, a small minority, I would say, mm-hmm. who found out their Armenian ancestry, this and that. But the, the, the broad public, a good part of the broad public, began to say, okay, maybe we didn't do it enough. So denialism is not about knowing. It's a political position. And a political action should be taken, taken against it. It's not that like you know, it's not an issue. I'm not saying that we should stop our intellectual endeavors or efforts. We shouldn't. But it that's not going to be the solution. Despite all you still have, for instance, like you know, gen- Holocaust deniers around, even today, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe more so today. Right? And the war facts, I mean, it's such a well documented, despite the fact that it's a well documented. Uh, story. So I think one thing we need to do in both cases of uh, genocide, uh, Armenian uh, and uh, Western genocide, is to stop responding to denialism. And for the German audience, you know, I think it might be a good thing, good good example to think about what happens. Exactly. I mean, why do you think, for example, students at German universities uh, have to learn about Dersim and Imami, for example? I would say there are many reasons. Uh, and first of all, I mean, I think it is a very good, I, I don't want to say a good example, but unfortunately it's a good example. I don't know if a genocide is, a, is good for anything, but you know, I'm talking about it as an example to understand, to better contextualize historically the Holocaust. Because it is actually, uh, of course, lots of differences, there are lots of differences, but in terms of the perpetrator's mindset, there are very significant, very striking similarities. That's one thing. Um, a second thing to the reason is, I think it's good to know about genocide in general, because it tells so much about who we are. Because those people, for example, uh, Zeynep Turkil was like, you know, did, like, you know this, this, he, she found an amazing memoir in, 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 in a Turkish library about this uh, soldier who, 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 was, who was in service, active in, uh, active in service at the time, who participated in the genocide. And his indifference is incredible. Like Hannah Arendt's uh, description of the trial. Eichmann, yeah. Yeah, Eichmann trial. I mean, incredible. So he's, he could be any of us. So that's another reason that we should know it. And another thing, reason, good reason for, uh, especially Germans, is that you know, these people are around us. Especially Dersimis and Zazak um, Alevis are probably disproportionately represented in Germany because many of them came, like, they are among the early comers to Germany because of the earthquake in Warthor area, right, 1960s. So you have a big community. And interestingly, uh, the, the, the Zaza language of that area is a very peculiar language, is dying in, in its so-called native land, homeland, but still does much better in Germany. So the reason why I'm telling you this is like, because they are the neighbors. There are so many of them around them, right? And, and beyond that, there is the issue, the Kurdish issue, right? This is, you know, it's again like you know I try to like you know make the deal that like you know that that's it's not the same thing but it's part of it it's part of it like you know when people think about the Kurdish issue, I mean it's a good reference point to understand the historical you know uh, background of what happened and and a final thing you know unfortunately that area still you know the conflicts are sim- simmering uh, unfortunately a bit potentials of catastrophe, future catastrophe, right? Yeah. And, and we are talking about like in 1937, 38, but you know what? A few years ago, Ezidis were subjected to. And Ezidis and Desidis are very similar, you know, comparable groups in terms of their faith, religion, ethnicity, very comparable groups. Right? And it's not only crazy that are Ezidis or Desidis, but uh, many groups in Turkey today mm. are under are high risk. And think about like, you know, uh, Syria, 
and elsewhere. So I think Germans have many good reasons to to study the Darsim genocide. Thank you very much. I also agree with you, as you've pointed out, that uh, history is uh, always transnational. And um, one important thing maybe to mention is also that with the labor migration that happened in the 60s and 70s, especially from the rural areas in Anatolia, uh, many people from these communities have uh, migrated to Germany and are now living with us and maybe even studying at German universities a lot. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.